go live. That's good. Thank you. It's live. Okay. So it is uh, 2 p.m. So let's uh, let's go ahead. So thank you everyone for joining today. We're really excited to have today's event, uh, which is a panel discussion on how to you build a research network. And we have a really exciting panel. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us today. But before we go ahead, um, I want to tell you a little bit about how it will work. Um, so we have set up a slider where you can ask the panel anonymous questions. Um, and we'll go to these questions at the end of the uh, panel discussion. Um, but in the meantime, uh, if you could log into Slido and uh, take our survey, which would help us determine how to, uh, what to do with Unicorn in the future. You know, do you want us to keep doing uh, virtual seminars or would you prefer physical meetups? Uh, so this is really important and useful information for us to, so please uh, log into Slido and hear Madassa is sharing, uh, showing us what, what the questions are like. Um, so please share your thoughts uh, with us in this way. And this poll will stay open throughout the panel discussion. Um, so if you have a few moments uh, in the next hour or so, uh, please let us know. Uh, in the meantime, I'm really um, happy to, to share with you today um, our chair, to introduce our chair. So we have Hendrik Olbisch with us today, who's a professor of physics at Southampton University. Um, he works on optomechanics and uh, uh, experimental optomechanics and trying to probe new and fundamental physics um, and Henrik is also really involved in the uh, formation of the what's going to be the British Optomechanical Research Network. Um, and thank you so much, Henrik, for, for chairing this discussion today. Uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sophia. Um, thanks for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks for, for having me uh, to chair the session. Uh, and also many thanks for all these fantastic events you and uh, the the other organizers have organized over the past year. Um, so yes, uh, so the topic uh, of today is uh, how to, uh, how to uh, initiate and run uh, a research network. So um, you could say in a simple way, uh, what, what, what is a network? So basically, there, in my view, there are two things. So you want to bring uh, people together who have something in common, who have um, uh, you know, and a, a joint interest or they have a, a common goal. So they want to do something together uh, for, for whatever reason. So if it's a research network, then the motivation for joining up has to do uh, with, with research. Um, and then I think the second important thing is that you have to, when you, when you think about uh, forming a network, you have to set some rules. So how will these people work together? Um, uh, what, what, how do they interact? Um, what, what are the, um, uh, the activities of the network and how is that all coordinated? So uh, I think these are, these are the, the, the important things and we, we will have a discussion with the panel. So I will uh, introduce the, uh, the panel members now um, to you and uh, I will ask them uh, each for, for um, you know, like a, a first, a first question on, on their uh, experience with networks and uh, then we will see. So I think we have a good mix. Um, so I start with our first panelist. So it's Sophie uh, Martin from, from uh, University College. So Sophie is a first year PhD student uh, in, in health science um, and, and the uh, I for Health uh, CDT. Um, she received an MSc in physics from Imperial College in 2020. Uh, and then she decided to use her physics and computational skills towards the advancement of healthcare. healthcare. Um, so um, outside her studies, um, Sophie is uh, uh, involved in improving uh, the representation of black and underrepresented groups in STEM. Um, and she's director of uh, media and marketing for the Blackhead Lab family. And of course, my first question will be what, what are these activity, activities in, in the, in the Blackhead Lab family. Um, so, um, and she's also trustee for the educational charity Project Partners, who have developed a fresh perspective on uh, project-based learning at school. So there's, there's a lot of activities uh, which uh, uh, Sophie is involved outside uh, her PhD and um, uh, good to have you, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, maybe if you if you want to take uh, a minute and tell us about uh, you know what kind of network is this uh, Blackett Lab uh, family if I pronounce it correctly sorry if I if I say it in an, in an odd so, way that, that's correct thank you for the lovely introduction 
Um, so yes, the Black It Love family, the name kind of comes from where we all met. So the Black It Laboratory is the physics department at Imperial College. And essentially we're a group of, of UK based black physicists. So each of us have undertaken either undergrad studies or currently work in areas related to physics. And it was kind of birthed out of um, our shared experiences really in different, in different ways, but each of us who went to Imperial found that we were a minorities in our years or in our cohorts when studying um, physics. So we kind of all kept in contact and decided to generate a, a network and a space where people could connect and, and essentially highlight the, the presence of black physicists in the UK um, by expanding it to students and professors and researchers in the field um, in different universities and in different spaces. So it's kind of grown um, over the last six months and we've got a, a pool of about 50 members now, each working <laughs> in physics. Okay, thanks. Um... So I'm, I'm sure we will come back to uh, to this when when we go through our discussion of you know how to start a network and how to run it and um, you know what are the rules of networks and how to set them. So let me just go and introduce uh, the next member of our panel. So the next is Mark uh, Basin uh, from Ryle Space. So Mark is a quantum physicist uh, with over 10 years experience in quantum physics and cold atoms. Um, so he's interested in a range of topics, and it goes from quantum sensing of magnetic and electromagnetic fields uh, using thermal atomic vapors, uh, all the way to studying fundamental physics with atom interferometry. Um, and he has a range of experience uh, in industrial engagement through the UK Quantum Technology Hub uh, in sensing and timing and um, the Faraday challenge. Um, but he's also... Uh, in the Marie Curie um, Alumni Network or Association, and I think he's co-director of, of that one. Um, and of course, uh, great to have you, Mark. Thanks for, for joining us and um, contributing to, to the uh, panel discussion on networks. And my question, of course, is, is in relation to this Marie Curie Network. So what, what kind of network is that? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Hendrik, and thanks uh, for the invitation. Yeah, the, the Marie Curie Alumni Association is an initiative that was started by the European Commission. Um, and so there are now around uh, 19,000 uh, members spread across all the world, so around 150 nationalities. So there's a, uh, there's a range of geographical chapters. So there's a United Kingdom chapter, and I'm secretary of that, as well as like various working groups sort of devoted to various aspects around um, research and society. Um, and so it's, it's funded still by the European Commission um, and we do various events such as um, sort of soft skills training and networking and we try to bring our members together and kind of uh, benefit society, let's say, in the long run. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Good to have you. Um, let me move on. So the next um, um, member of the panel I want to introduce to you is uh, Miriam uh, Krabman. So she is working for EPSRC. So she's portfolio manager for ICT. There and her research portfolio includes optical devices, optoelectronic devices, uh, and RF devices. Uh, but she's also um, uh, has the oversight of strategic equipment, which is very important to many of us. Uh, national research facilities and Horizon Europe within um, the ICT theme. Um, and before that, she did a PhD in medical materials, also at UCL. Um, so welcome to. Um, to the panel, welcome to uh, join uh, for, for joining the discussion. Um, and of course, now um, my, my, my first question is to you. So, what what is your um, so your view on networks, or when do you get in in contact with networks? I guess it, that is when you know they somehow hit EPSRC, and some people try to um, you know get funding to initiate initi initiate a network. Um, so, um, yeah, so what, what, what's your experience with that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Hendrik. So we have a mechanism to fund networks within EPSRC, um, and it really spans um, the entire portfolio of EPSRC, so any aspects of it, but obviously being part of the ICT theme, we would process the applications that come from ICT-based research, and I guess optomechanics would fall into that. Um, I think it's definitely more formalised, and we would kind of have an expectation of, um, you know, some sort of pre-groundwork 
um, and kind of a, a demonstration of a community need for this network in order for it to be assessed and then potentially funded. So I think perhaps it's more the formal end of what a network would look like mm -hmm. compared to, to other colleagues on the panel. Okay, thanks a lot. So also there, I'm, I'm sure we will, you know, come back to, to this point when we discuss the details of, um, you know, how, how a network should should work in, in, in the best case. Um, okay, so then let me move on to um, to our final member of this panel, uh, Matthew uh, Worsley. Um, so Matt is uh, working for, for KTN, uh, the Knowledge Transfer Network, uh, in enabling uh, technologies. Uh, so he's particularly working on photonics. Um, and he, he began his career in defense science, and he was with what was called the D Defense Research Agency. And you, you may know that that was then split into DSTL, into, in, into Kinetic, so in, into a company and into still a, a governmental institution for very interesting reasons. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we have time to talk about this, but uh, let, me tell me, uh, let me tell you more about Matt. Uh, so he was moving from applied research to project management and then business development. He then worked uh, for uh, some time at the Defense Diversification Agency before moving to a knowledge transfer role at the University of Birmingham. Um, so before he joined KTN, um, it was business, business development manager for the Scottish University's uh, Physics Alliance, um, uh, where he was responsible for knowledge, knowledge exchange and in the broad sense, including public outreach, as well as more traditional commercial activities. Um, and now at KTN, um, it actually helps companies, so it's a different uh, aspect of, of networks. Um, so he helps companies to grow and to develop collaborations and support um, in support of the innovation process. And I guess that is basically all about money, how to you know, get uh, these, these companies get resources, get funding and uh, finance to, to develop their ideas. So um, I guess my question to you, Matt, is when it comes to build networks, and that is maybe already starting uh, the, the, the first topic of our discussion, um, you know, in, in your role at KTN, is it always the case that basically uh, the community, let's say um, it could be companies, it could be uh, academics, it could be a mixture of both, are they always approaching you with, it, with an idea and say, hey, we, we want to build a network on that topic, or is it um, is it uh, also, you know, working sometimes in the other way that, that you actually have an idea that there, there could be the need for a specific network on a specific topic, um, and then you you reach out to to find people who could join for that. So first, welcome to the panel, and uh, that is your first question. It was a long one. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> That's a good question. I should say sorry for submitting such a long bio that and making you read all that out because <laughs> everyone's was a lot shorter. Yeah, you did a lot of stuff. I think that's the reason. <laughs> I thought you were just gonna gonna print it. So yes, um, uh, yeah. Um, I guess I would say that where we most effectively operate is 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 in that case where things don't happen automatically by themselves. So if the community and whatever community that is, however we're, we're looking at it, um, came together um, by themselves, saw an opportunity, came together and, and did it, then there'd be sort of no need, no need for intervention. I think where, where KTN really sort of add value is in, is in sort of spotting perhaps where, where things might come together or see where things are currently coming together um, and helping people bring themselves together um, and that might just be a short intervention. So we, we sort of work with them and then, then they're off by themselves and, and doing it. So um, if people come to us with a network and they're capable of doing it, then we'd say, go on and, and do it. So we're, we're, we're probably interested most in, in where the networks are not already coming together. Mm. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so there are different ways, obviously, to uh, to start this, and uh, I guess the first question we we, we maybe um, uh, you know should discuss here is why why do we actually need to form these networks, and is it always that it comes from? Um, and of course, we we talk about research networks. Is is it always that um, you know is a scientific question is the starting point, or or is it maybe also more about um, you know different aspects of of forming a community? Yeah, so. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you want to maybe uh, elaborate on this point. 
I think, yeah, the most obvious one is if you have a common scientific goal and you need the shared expertise of um, various different people to, to contribute to that. But I guess away from science, you could you could look at some of the more industrially applied um, endeavors. So like the quantum hubs or Faraday Challenge, for example. And they, they're really trying to translate the science into new products and ultimately into jobs for UK PLC, as they call it. Um, and so they're not natural bedfellows sometimes. So having some, some facility where you can join people together, maybe joint funding opportunities, seminars, uh, workshops, that kind of thing, I think that really helps uh, gather people gather people together and, and push things forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, uh, okay, so it, it always starts with, with, with a scientific idea, but then, of course, there has to be like a check, how is the landscape and does it actually fit and and uh, then I guess that is about the point when it hits, uh, you know, the desk of, of uh, Miriam, maybe. And uh, so people people come with this idea and they want to know, is, is that is that something which, which could work? Is, is that, uh, my, is my impression right? <laughs> um, I think partially. I think sometimes it's not always about addressing a scientific question. Sometimes um, the, um, the reasoning behind the network actually can be for community building. Um, you know, you can have a specific uh, research area, but the community itself may be quite disparate across the nation, or maybe um, you have very established groups that are not very aware of what each other are doing. So sometimes it really is just to bring people together um, and perhaps um, kind of, you know, come together with a, a cohesive strategy to actually collectively push a specific research area. Um, or sometimes it can be to actually just address a scientific question, but I find more are on the former than, than the latter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it can vary and different research areas have different requirements. So there really isn't one size fits all. Um, they can be different sizes, um, you know, request funding for lots of different things. Um, it can be, yeah, quite different between the different types of research areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we, we already touched uh, with, with, with Matt on the aspect that, you know, there could be, you know, academic, versus industry so there can be these links and networks uh, are maybe good vehicles to you know mediate uh, you know communication of this uh, naturally very different uh, communities so we will come back to this point later but I wanted to maybe uh, ask Sophie if you know at this very starting point uh, um, you know from your point of view as a as a PhD student what, what about skills so is there anything which you would expect in a, in a, in a research network to give to you um, uh, you know, in, in a certain, let's say, scientific context, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's quite interesting because I think uh, Mariam hit it on the head that you can have networks who almost are a half formed of other networks in, in kind of like a cascading structure where I can think of various groups I'm part of which are kind of like overarching umbrellas for kind of offshoots. But I think that one thing as an early career researcher that's quite important for me is this idea of scientific communication. And I think these kind of discussions and open forums where people can actually address kind of like public facing questions is really important for me to see in a research, research network. Because I think it's more valuable than ever to, to be able to communicate your research and why it's important to people outside of your, your field. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, so okay. So, if 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 I summarize this, what we have said is so, so. Now we have our idea, and it can be really, you know, a broad spectrum of possibilities. Uh, what it is, but uh, and we have done some, let's say, capability mapping. We know there's there's you know expertise out there which can be distributed vastly, um, uh, but there's also a need. Yeah, so we it makes sense to form a network. So now, how do we start it? What is like the first? the first good thing uh, to do yeah so I don't know Matt do you uh, want to um, you know give us some insight how when, when, when people approach you uh, with, with these ideas what, what is really like the, the thing which they have to uh, to have or to to work on to to kick off the idea and to to form a network yeah um, I guess one thing I just wanted to add to the previous point uh, and so you touched on communication which is really important and of course that's a two-way communication a dialogue so society the general public is, is is the other part of the the network that we that we need to work with mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, we're, we're just so so. You perhaps need to identify your your core of your your network. So so who who's starting, and you that you need to understand or need to sort of work out where the rest of the network, you know, is going to come from. And you might not know the answer to that when you start with. In fact, you probably don't know the answer to that because you, you you've got you've got to dig out. And then <clears throat> I, I I think. No, it's just a question of knowing what you don't know, but but looking looking not in the usual places as well is is useful. So as we talk about society uh, getting in there, and 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 I, I think we're going to come on. I, I know we're going to come on later, sort of to diversity of, of networks. But if you keep going to the usual places and the usual suspects, you get a you you get a, a fairly sort of boring network, if you like. That's not gonna that's not gonna perform. So. So you, you, your your starting point, I guess, is to find out, you know, who who can be in the network, who else who else is is, is doing what, and and then at some point, I think you're 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 going to come on to what what resources you're going to actually need to keep the network going. Mm. Okay, yeah, and and then uh, I, I guess there there are of course different uh, let's say ways or different pots uh, where these resources can come from, and then uh, you know with 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 the choice of those different. Let's let's call it funding sources. Um, there will be rules, right? So uh, I know from experience. So I was involved in a in a European cost action, and there are quite strong rules, right? So when you decide to do a cost action, then basically they define everything and how you have to run it and how you have to have your meetings and everything. But maybe uh, Miriam, um, so so how how strict is this from your experience within EPSSC? Is is that really um, you know defined by the funding agency, or is there also some freedom by the people who actually want to 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 start and run the network? Um, how they um, you know set the rules and uh, you know get the whole thing started? Yeah. Um, so we try not to be too prescriptive again because different networks need different things and will kind of behave in different ways. Um, but there will be specific grant conditions, like there should be. Um, an advisory board meeting at least I think every year to make sure that things are going on track and you have external individuals on this board as well to help you kind of evaluate and make sure that they're your, you're doing what you said you would do and what you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, I think beyond that most of it again will kind of refer to the application has actually been submitted. Um, typically with networks there will be um, an EPSRC contact who will be kind of aware of what it is you're doing mm -hmm. um, because typically they're, they're quite it's not a very expensive um, for, um, piece of investment but it's a very um, wide-reaching investment so I think EPSRC are always quite interested to have some sort of direct contact with it so there will always be an ES, EPSRC person when you have a board meeting to kind of um, make sure that we're up to date with what's going on and if any issues are identified we're, we're available for that um, but I think it doesn't really digress too far from kind of standard um, grant conditions. Um, so and again, you, I, I guess you, you, you already expect something like a critical mass, right? Is, is, is yeah. that be defined? What, what is a critical mass? for? Um, and I think that would be quite tricky to say. Again, I think it will range across different mm. communities. Um, you know, for the photonics community, it's huge. So we would expect a sizable um, group already in place. But with maybe, you know, theoretical computing or fundamentals of computing, it might be quite small. Um, so again, it's not very prescriptive, but it's definitely, it's, it's all relative. Mm. Um, and because these applications will be processed by the, the relevant portfolio manager who has this background knowledge of the community, they'll be able to gauge, actually, you know, this is suitable and this is something appropriate for that specific research community. Um, so yeah, again, it's it's. I wouldn't say there's X amount of number of people that should be involved already. It really um, varies. Hmm. Okay, thanks. So 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 uh, maybe maybe Sophie, because you 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 have just started this uh, the Blackhead Network some less than a year ago. Um, so so what is your experience? Was it was it easy uh, actually to find uh, um, you know the right let's say guidance or um, uh, you know, structure to start the network, or was the, how how did you discuss this in the group, or did you have have help from 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 somewhere outside to give you advice on what are like the important things you have to put in place? Yeah, um, it definitely was a challenge, and I think for us, a big 
benefit was that we had a range of experience within people forming the network. We had the students and teachers and professors and institutions. And I think we kind of looked to existing frameworks for kind of what our network should look like and, and how we should kind of build that. So for those that had teaching experience, we kind of like modeled the kind of structure um, of having like heads of department and people overseeing certain aspects of our our network and use that as a way to kind of move forward with like how, our, how we should operate um but I certainly think that there's no there's no like one definition of what a network should look like because it depends on the aims so I think for us we identified that the core essence of what we're doing is is trying to kind of amalgamate research um produced by our members across the UK and I think that was kind of the driving force for thinking about how we should how we should structure ourselves whereas mm -hmm. a, comp a network built with a different aim something perhaps more um, specific and technical may have different priorities yeah okay good thanks um yeah Mark, Mark exactly yeah so please <laughs> yeah just just following on from Sophie's point I think it's very important to get the goals pretty clear at the start of the network I think if if you know what you're trying to achieve, it really does help to shape what it's going to look like. And that's the definitely the place to start for me. So for the, the Marie Curie, it's a lot about networking and, and being able to track the impacts that the fellowships have on people's careers. And, and the European Commission are interested in knowing how their money is spent, basically. So, so um, having clear goals is definitely the way to go. Hmm. Um, so, so, so Mark, because you, you also have been uh, in, involved in, in the, the quantum technology hub, so that is like a big structure, a big, ne a big network, which was, you know, um, uh, installed some, some years ago in, in, in the UK and is now in the second phase and um, there are many, many people involved. And uh, I, I remember there was, you know, quite a lot of consultation, uh, interaction and meetings and events to um, to actually, you know, uh, decide how to start. So I don't know if you, if you look back, what, what was like the important process um, within the community um, to come to the decision to start a network in that exact form and, um, you know, in that distribution and with that people involved. So is there is there like, um, um, I guess, again, th there are many things one can do, but as a, as a process, what, 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 is, what was like a... a the yeah, co communication think, way to to get it done i think the overriding reason that the, the hubs exist and were formed were to sort of increase the engagement with industry it was it, the point was that the lots of the quantum science has been known and been sort of proven in the lab and mm. sort of the more difficult part for academics is then to get that thing into the real world and to do that you, you need to engage with industry and so there were various um various collaborators that had, sort of had been in sort of EU projects and sort of FET things, sorry, mm -hmm. trying not to use too many acronyms, but <laughs> um, so try, trying to build upon those sort of maybe, let's say, smaller networks to the successes that you had in the past, and then naturally those, those get expanded, and then that sort of gives the evidence base that something larger is needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so then... Um... I guess we, we have more or less a good understanding of, uh, you know, uh, how to start the whole thing. Uh, so I, I remember uh, I, I had a discussion that was about some, some space related things. And, if, uh, you know, someone, someone advised me that, you know, if you want to start um, uh, uh, an initiative, you have to basically uh, follow your own drum. So you have to, you know, make some noises, you have to trigger some activities, and then you have to somehow get momentum into into the whole thing yeah? and that of course flies uh, if there's a good idea and a good goal and a good definition of how it sits in already existing other things yeah okay good so then let's move on let's assume we have you know we have started our you know imaginary network now and now we want to grow it we want to basically include a lot of people and we want to make it big or maybe not even big we want to make it successful so what is what is the you know a good approach to to grow the network so sophie you, you you have your hand up you want to say something yeah i was just gonna kind of touch on the starting of the network and i suppose it kind of 
leads on to this question, but just thinking, this is open to the other panelists as well, just thinking about the resources you need to start a network and mm. how that varies depending on your application and um, yeah, your focus and your goal. Because I think, I think people might be interested to kind of hear about what you need to kind of plan when pooling people together to, to form a network. I know that for us, um, a big concern was kind of obviously time um, commitments and getting a firm understanding of what what a day to day operation of the network would look like for each of the, the people building it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know if the others have anything to share about about the resources involved or the funding side. Yeah, Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it, it very much, of course, depends on on what kind of a network it is and, and, and how you're how you're going to run it so um also actually i suppose what what constitutes what constitutes a network almost because you can you could have a group of people let, let's say we wanted to call ourselves the the zoom photonics group um, and we represent all the photonics people that, that, that are on zoom and, and then if we say you know, if we if we make enough noise about that and say we're the Zoom Photonics Group, then everyone then says, "Oh, well, we'll go and ask the, the Zoom Photonics Group." And then, so in some cases, what what you what you need um, is is often quite small, but it, it it it's usually at least one sort of key individual um, that's going to be able to drive that forward. Bang, bang, bang the, the drum, as you said. Um, but then it depends how how you want to grow it as well, because. Um, if you need other people, if you need proper resource, so you know you're going to meet or you know you're going to have to get get coffee. Now, one of the other things I guess to consider is is whether you. I'm just trying to think of a better word, but I haven't come up with one in the last ten seconds. Franchise your group. So, so one of the one of the things that that that, that I'm involved in, and it's it's an initiative in 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 Scotland primarily, is on opening up photonics. So, so it's a background, more diverse photonics background. And one of the questions is we, we have a model of where that's going uh, in, in Scotland, but do we want to have that broader? Um, so if we're going to have opening up photonics Wales or England or opening up photonics UK, um, do the group of people that started that in Scotland make themselves responsible for that across the whole UK and abroad? Or, or do you franchise it, <laughs> if you like, say you want to run your own opening up photonics network, um, you know, this is this is how, how how you abide by it, and then of course, if you then get into the, the bigger things about okay, you want to run conferences and meetings and stuff, you know, you're you're then talking about giving up quite a lot of quite a lot of resources. And that, that where you sort of seek seek funding and things like that, it's probably going to be going to be important to do that because there's only you either need funding or you you need some really committed people that are going to be able to sort of manage the money coming in and money coming out to to make that work. Um, which is a sort of almost like a trade association sort of model. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so yeah, yeah maybe you, 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 you touched on this already now. Um, so, so, so what are the events, uh, you know, in, in a network? What, what different types are there in, in, in principle? And how do we choose like the right ones for, for this network? Or how can we be creative to come up with new ones? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know, uh, Mark, do you, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, I guess in the era of Zoom, there's not a lot of choice at the moment. It's mostly <laughs> online, but the, I think people really have missed meeting in person. And definitely when I go to network meetings, I, I see it as a sort of badge of success if I've come out with a new idea, basically, when, I, when I've met with people. And that's, that can just be discussions over coffee or seeing someone's presentation and thinking, ah, mm, okay, maybe we could do it differently or something like that. Um, so definitely in-person events will be yeah, coming back strong, I suppose, but there's also this balance of travel and being able to include everybody, which has been one of the benefits of Zoom. So having a hybrid sort of approach, I think is probably going to be the way forward. So maybe having local meetings in the Southeast and then one in Glasgow or something like that, if we're photonics minded. Um, and then meeting online and in-person. So you get both the benefits of not having to travel hundreds of miles and being able to meet people in person. Mm. I, I, I like that definition that, you know, it, it, it's a good event if you, if you come out and you have new ideas. That, that's actually, 
Yeah, it's uh, quite I can, scientifically minded. Can connect to that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's <laughs> that's really great. So, 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 Miriam, you you want to uh, contribute at this point? Yeah. So, I mean, just I was just reflecting on um, network events I did physically go to before the pandemic, um, and again, it's a reflection of your your community or the network itself. So, um, I know the networks that have run ECR sessions. Um, where they've, um, you know, brought in ECRs from their community and have done things like um, how to write proposals, how the whole process writes, how the whole process works in submitting proposals, um, things around developing relationships and, I guess, their own networks to help them um, develop themselves as independent researchers. Um, there's always also the, the scientific talks. Um, there's also been events around uh, EDI within that specific community as well. Um, so I think it typically is quite flexible and it should kind of, I guess, respond to the need of that specific community. Um, so those are examples I have when we could physically go to meetings and yeah. they are still going ahead virtually. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good bridge. Um, so, so Sophie, so, so um, now again, I, I, I ask you as a, as a PhD student, so as, as, as a young researcher uh, joining a research network, um, what, what is it what you would want to get out of it? Um, so maybe as an example, this, this very, um, you know, uh, unicorn seminar series, which we are, which we are using now. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there, there have been, um, you know, various different ideas for events. Yeah? So uh, we have, we are lucky that we have very uh, creative and, uh, uh, you know, motivated organizers who come always up with, with new ideas. And so we had, uh, you know, this panel discussions, for instance, we have talks, we also had lectures. So, so which of these formats are, you know, you know the, the most useful uh, from your point of view? I think um, each can be useful in different ways. It does depend. I think a variety is always the best way forward. Um, for example, as part of the PhD in my cohort of researchers, we can we have some networks which operate on a rotating basis. So mm -hmm. one week it might be a presentation, and then the next it's an open discussion, and then the next week it could be an external speaker. And I think just having the variety opens you up to um, well, different amounts, different types of content and different topics. Um, but I think it's difficult at the moment, of course, with the restriction of everything being online, um, as Mark said. And with that, I think the kind of extra effort put into fostering an interactive environment goes a really long way. Like me personally, it, it's quite easy to become disengaged when things are, are virtual. So networks who make an extra effort to, you know, have an interactive Q&A session or take feedback via Mentimeter and polls, um, just allow you to kind of get the conversation going. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely say that's been quite important kind of post pandemic. Yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, uh, so, so as, a, as, a, as, a, as a teacher at the university, I know that online teaching, that can be quite challenging. Yeah? So if you have to deliver a lot of facts and, and knowledge and uh, um, it's very, uh, you know, challenging to to keep up discussion and keep people engaged, really. So uh, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, now um, growing the network. There's of course now the question I, I mentioned in my in my intro that you know one one has to set the rules and there have to be you know um, uh, there have to be clear arrangements. How do we run this? And of course, diversity is um, is is one of the key things. So, how how can we implement a network which is really welcoming everyone? Uh, I know that is very very difficult. And how what, what are what are good ways uh, to do it? So, what is your experience um, in 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 doing this? Um, I don't know who, who wants to start on this one. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll say some things. If you like. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Sometimes it's easy just to do the thing that you've always done before, because that's how it was always done. Um, and 
Um, if I think about networks and events, so I, 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 I work in photonics, I do a lot of photonics events. And um, when I go to photonics events uh, in person, I see a lot of people that look just like me. Um, some of them are a bit older. Um, and that's, that's, mainly, that's mainly the difference. And what that means is that if somebody goes to one of these events that doesn't look just like me, um, they, they say, well, where is this as a career for me? And, 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 and what is this, you know? Um, and there's a whole load of, there's a whole load of reasons and what for that. And then one of the things that we, that we do in, in KTN, or one of the things, I, I, I've run event series, and our, our standard go-to um, can quite often be, well, let's pick a, a professor um, to, to speak about that, or let's pick a company CEO. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why, why women uh, and other groups are not getting into, into the chairs, into, into professors in the same, way, same rate as men. Uh, and there's a whole other reasons about companies and, and rising in those. But then you have to go back and ask yourself, well, well do, do I actually need that? Or do I need someone that's got a really interesting story, working on a really interesting project? Um, and even just at the first point of just stopping and taking a look around what you've got and go, actually, this doesn't stack up, even to my, to my community. Um, you know, the, the, the people and who's attending your events, do the people in front of your events match who's attending your events? Um, so recognising that you can do something about it and trying to do something about it is a, is a, good, a good start in point, um, uh, I, I think. So, so I guess recognising recognizing where you are and, uh, you know, recognising where you would like to be and how you how you get there and, and there are ways and like I think I said earlier on as well you know if, if you keep looking in the same places um one of the things that we've just tried doing for example is actually having an open call for speakers which we generally the, the things we do generally we often the speakers just generate themselves or, or you, you ask people you know but we specifically asked um for the recent thing for 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 women in, in academia and industry for example just taking one group um saying we're you know, looking for any speakers, but particularly from from those groups as well, and, and just ju just trying different things to to to, to address that. So um. yeah, okay. So 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 that is that 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 is the that's the situation. So now now, Sophie, how how, how do we make STEM more diverse? I, I know it's a big question, but uh, just have a go. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a big question. It's big question. I I do I do think that a key part of it is, is kind of conversation really and, and talking to people who are affected most and getting their opinion um, because ultimately a lot of kind of planning and effort is needed before even getting to the event stage in order to make things accessible, open and um, actually attractive to people who don't, who already feel like it's not for them. It's, you know, you, you actually need to convince and make it seem welcoming uh, before you've even got to the planning stage and I think I think that essentially open dialogue is is the best route of kind of one flagging up things that you might not be aware of that that you can change or improve on and two giving others the space to feel like they can shape the events that you're, you're, you're carrying out and feel like they've got an input as opposed to just being um what's the word, kind of like a facilitator or participant of something, mm. but actually feel mm. part of the network itself. Um, so yeah, I think, I think like evidence I've seen of groups where, you know, they're, they're kind of talking quite openly and honestly and frankly about their shortcomings, for example. Um, I think the IOP have been trying to make an effort of being quite transparent about where they felt short in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these, these are, Kind of steps that we need to take to move forward in terms of making STEM more diverse. Okay, so 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 Miriam, so I, I know that EPSSC have have done a lot on uh, you know freshing up the approach to diversity and uh, um, so 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 what what is your take on this? So do, do you agree with with Sophie and what what are actually the things which you now definitely expect from from any bit which comes in? Um, to, to yeah. um, no, absolutely, I agree with everything that's been said. I think um, maybe, yeah, repeating what Matt said, it's, it's your approach. Um, so, you know, if someone puts in an application for a network and they find that their advisory boards and all the members that they have um, 
they're kind of aware of at the moment all look the same, then perhaps one of the things that I've increasingly seen is actually um, having groups um, work with um, consultancies that kind of specialize in um, promoting EDI within STEM. And that's absolutely something that you would be able to, you know, claim funds for. That actually, if you find within yourself and your nearest colleagues, you don't, you can't really see a way of doing it. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to approach professionals that will be able to kind of enlighten you and help you um, open up perhaps your network to um, underrepresented people. Um, so there's there's always a way. I mean, even if it's something you can't do within yourself, there's, there's always a way. Mm. Okay, think things things a lot. So I, I think that is, uh, in 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 my view, um, is is really like the biggest challenge we we have uh, at the moment uh, in all our activities. And I mean, if you simply look at numbers, um, even though there there has been maybe something um, which we did in the past, but it was simply not effective. Yeah? So there's. Um, there's not a lot of diversity in STEM. Yeah. I, I don't know, Mark, if you have if you have comments on the, on this topic from your your perspective, uh, uh, you know, yeah. from 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 the Marie Curie uh, European network that should be super diverse, right? I mean, there's um, it's, it is in, in many ways, yeah, not a lot to add. Only that sort of the Marie Curie approach to it is to have a working group, or one of the approaches is to have a working group who formalise. Um, reporting back to the European Commission and trying actually to, to change policy. So I think re reporting back to the, the authorities, whoever they are, is, is a good way to do it. It's not, it's not enough just to sit back and say, we have a problem and we're not going to describe it, we're just going to live with it. You have to raise the issue and you have to try and get people to address it, even if it's in the long run. I think you have to, have to make some noise. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to touch on that because I think one thing that's quite important as well is that, like, like um, Mark's just touched on, it's kind of affirmative action and making sure that, you know, things aren't just empty statements. And by addressing it as a systematic problem, you prove that you've, you've actually committed to changing by making policy, um, being transparent about changes that you're implementing and structures that you're putting in place, even if it's, you know, a dedicated EDI team within your network it kind of acts as evidence that you're actively trying to, to kind of push for change within the mm -hmm. network and I think that's something that is needed at the moment um, as opposed to kind of just statements and, and yeah okay thank you uh thank you uh um for for that so so um the, the next point I, I wanted to discuss with you is actually uh, the management of a network. And it, of course, also um, is related to all of the things which we have discussed before. It, of course, depends, you know, what is the goal of the network? What is the community um, you, you, you want to engage? Uh, what are the people you want to reach? How diverse you want to make it? So, and of course, again, there, there is not the best uh, way of uh, of managing a network, but but there are different options. Yeah, so you can have, for instance, one very strong PI, and uh, that person can basically take all decisions. And um, is is that a good way? I mean, that is you know much probably the one where you can get like quick decisions, and where you know uh, when it comes to big money decisions, that is where, where 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 maybe there's a preference to do something like that, and you know. In, in, in difference to that or as a, as an, as a, as a complementary uh, approach, it could be really like an, um, uh, a committee or a group of people who are managing it. Um, so so what, what is your feeling? What is like the, um, the approach one should, uh, you know, consider um, when, when forming network? Maybe Matt, if you, um, if you want to uh, talk about this. Um, yeah, it's okay. I was thinking the thing that you start your PI. So the best way of running, running, a, you know, running, running countries of a benevolent dictator. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, there could be an argument. I could say maybe controversial. It could be an argument for having an all, an all powerful PI. But I would say if you have that, um, it's really important. And I don't think this would actually work with with the funding from from some places. Like Marion could correct me on this, but. What what I would have is right. You're 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 the PI, but you have to give up that network after three years and hand it over to somebody else. Um, and it's a case I think with 
you know, and it probably feeds in. It's important to sort of have a bit of a, of a refresh of, of, of where you've got committees and committees and groups, because otherwise these things tend to stagnate. And it, I guess it also depends on, which you touched on earlier, the lifetime of your network, what, 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 you, what you want it to be. So um, you know, we spoke about IOP before, and one of the things that IOP, we do they have their committees and they have the sort of nations and branches where, where, they, where they do the outreach. And it's quite important, you know, you've got time limited positions on those committees and, and they refresh. And I've, I've, I've seen a few of these, few of these refresh and you know, over time you get complete change and you get these kind of new, new people coming in. So um, yeah, that's important. Sometimes you need a really big hitter um, and that that person doesn't necessarily have to get involved in running running the network, but you know we 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 spoke about quantum earlier on, and there are you know like, there are one or two really big hitters in quantum, and you need you need those people to go in and and tell ten Downing Street why it's important, um, and to do that you don't necessarily need those people deciding you know uh, how many committee meetings or conferences we, we we're going to have uh, you know. So yeah, it, 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 it depends on the size. And then equally, um, if I think about some of the uh, trade association type, type, type groups, um, you know, you don't necessarily need somebody for those that, that's going to be technically running them. You need somebody that, that can understand how to sort of make, it, make useful events and conferences and, and, and networks and, and generate that. And more importantly, how to actually make that self-sustaining. Um, so we, yeah, I guess a big, it depends is probably my, my, my input. Yeah, so Mark, yeah, you, you want to say something? Yeah, just to add, add to what Matt said, it, it depends on who's paying as well. I think if we're talking about something run by volunteers, it's an awful lot to ask them to do it for, you know, ad infinitum. Um, so the, the rotation model, I think it is pretty good if you do have volunteers. Whereas you're not funded 20% or something to be in a, in a project, that that's, could be the way to go. And it, it also speaks to the question of who's benefiting from the network. Is it is it just a pet project of a PI or is it actually for the members of the network to, to forward their careers and to, to make new connections? Okay, thanks. So, so, so Miriam, uh, I, I wanted to ask you in this context, so, so how big is actually the flexibility from the point of view of EPSRC on, on that point? I mean, for instance, for uh, a research grant or a program grant, I, I would think that it is preferred to really have this, you know, strong person, um, uh, which, which, is, which is running basically the show. Um, uh, but for a network grant, so is, is it possible to have this, this alternative to have like a, you know, a gang of, of people who, who run the show? <laughs> um, I mean, so, Practically speaking, there will be a PI because that's how our applications work. Mm -hmm. um, but we would expect that there would be a board and it would be sort of a collaborative effort in running it. And, you know, the more open those decisions are, actually, the more inclusive they can be. Yeah. So we definitely need to sort of push that um, way of, of working. Um, when it comes to networks as well, um, it's possible to ask for funding for a project manager. So if you are a very active networking you do have a lot of events and you know the the academics running it actually don't have the time to set up seminars they are able to um, hire a person to kind of focus on that side of things um, and that person can be from the same community or they could be you know someone from far beyond that community but have that expertise um, so the it's important to have enough resource to run a good network but it's not necessarily important where it comes from, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be those named individuals, the PIs or co-wives who are delivering everything. Um, so if they can make an argument um, that they would like to hire XYZ or um, the secretary or whatever to help them make this a good network, then that's something we are able to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so, so Sophie, I, I have one question for you, which is this one. So let's assume there's this model of there's like this big PI network. So there is, and this person is you. Uh, as, as, as the manager of this network, um, what would be the most important thing for you? What is the, the thing which you would make sure, you know, that is implemented and that works? What, what would be that thing? 
you got some <laughs> big questions for me. Um, I think I think that as we kind of touched on today, a big thing will be the people I surround myself with, especially if I'm operating as a sole PI. Then my next question is that well, the people that I'm around need to reflect a diversity of thought. There's no point kind of hiring more people who think like I do. Um, yeah. I think I think it would be quite important that you know the rest of the team um, can bring something new to, to, to the network and mm-hmm. yeah. um, and then and then obviously next onto that would definitely be my my kind of audience and who's interacting with the network and I think I'm quite excited by networks where they engage a lot with the users. Um, I've, I've experienced some groups which you know send out maybe quarterly questionnaires um, to say, you know, what what else would you like to see from us? What other topics would you like to get? And we actually carry out, you know, some some analysis of how they've been operating so far. Um, I think that's quite important because it just shows that you're taking an active responsibility mm-hmm. for taking their thoughts into account. But um, yeah, those are definitely two things I think I would I would aim to do. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um... So now management that also includes, of course, um, to check, you know, how is the network progressing? Is it is it delivering, you know, what what it intended to to deliver? Um, so so how, how do we measure success of a network? What what is an what is a successful network? Yeah? So so if we, if we can talk about this a little bit. So I don't know, Matt, do you want to to start? Yeah, and again, I'm going to say it depends, but but it it, 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 it <laughs> Yeah, because there are many, many different kinds of networks. So let, let's think. I mean, if you if you sort of start right at the back of what you want your network to achieve, so some of the things that we might from KTM bring out net, uh, bring networks together, we might say, okay, well, ultimately, we would like. Um, we think, let's say, Photonics has got a real big role to play in helping the UK meet its net zero targets. So. We want to bring people together to do some some new thing in, in photonics, um, and ultimately we want to see um, you know some some new companies form maybe so some jobs created. Um, the the academic parts of the group would have perhaps academic metrics, and, and it'd be be useful to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you might see collaborations. So in fact, right at the start of, of this this session. Um, I, um, you, you said something around, around around sort of KTN and and, and sort of the, the money creating creating the money, but it's also yes. the cycle benefit that's important to to us. There's always an eco- ultimately Treasury is funding all of this, and the, there's an argument going back to Treasury about that that's got something, but then there's a societal economic benefit and and the proportions of those might change depending on, on what what the network is and and there's you know there's you you're kind of kpis you can always have kpis in you know how many meetings you did how many papers you produced or how many um new collaborations and, and things like that but i guess the the ultimate sort of super super kpi super thing you're measuring is is where you wanted that network somewhere towards where you wanted that that network to go mm-hmm. Okay, so so good. So that that is that is uh, um, um, you know quantitative uh, analysis basically of achievements, and you have you have a catalog, and then you see how you how you perform against the, the set goals. Um, so that makes absolute sense uh, for management. So, so Mark, I, I liked your comment uh, at the beginning where you said that actually you know if you go to a meeting, then it was a good meeting. If you come back with with, with a good idea. So how, how does that come into you know context of saying it is just you know how many papers come out or how many new companies are, are, are funded? So it's a qual- qualitative versus quantitative question, <laughs> isn't it? Really, yeah. And you're asking a physicist who's naturally quantitative. So yeah, um, I guess people have to act on ideas, don't they? Really, for the for it to sort of be worthwhile. So yeah. maybe maybe eventually it does feed back into some of the things that Matthew said. But it probably it takes some time, so I guess one way around it is for people to sort of um, 
is to use sort of case studies to highlight sort of good experiences within the network. Mm. You, know, you yeah. see these websites where people have a quotation. You know, yeah. This network changed my life or something like that. So it's kind of <laughs> yes. the way to capture it. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, so, so Miriam, um, how is EPCRC looking at this? So, so how, how is the assessment done there to say that was a successful network and that's something which uh, we maybe don't have to repeat? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always tricky. So with, with networks, there will be annual reporting, um, which we would keep track of. Um, but I think as Matt referred to, anytime government money is involved, there's always a want for quantitative you know, measures. But having said that, increasingly, um, we've kind of moved towards case studies and just where there's been good examples of something. And that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, there was a meeting which resulted in a funded proposal. There, there's more to it than that. And I think UKRI as a whole is starting to appreciate that a bit more than mm. just, um, you know, how much potentially how much money came out of it. I mean, it's always good to be able to demonstrate that it generated X amount for UK PLC. But um, yeah, I think we're kind of moving towards case studies and we always encourage um, these types of investments to submit any interesting case studies they think um, for us to kind of keep hold of. And when Bayes or Treasury comes back and says, what did this money do? We can demonstrate it through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so, Sophie, so um, what, what is your take on this? So what, what, is, what is a successful network? Yeah, I, I agree with everything I've been said. I think also what could also be quite interesting is thinking about interaction with the network um, and how that changes over time. So it's quite a, a good way to just get indication of, of the success of the network is thinking about how people are engaging with, with the activities that you're doing and mm. your output. Um, I suppose you could you could argue that that's, that's not always directly proportional to, to the success, you know, just because um, people aren't engaging in different ways doesn't mean it's not, not achieving something. But I think, <laughs> You know, in the in the era we live in, um, in the height of kind of social media and and online kind of engagement, it can be a good indicator for for kind of what impact you're having widespread, like uh, outside of just your immediate community or wherever the network is based. Um, it's a good way. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. For me, uh, engagement of of you know member of members or you know participants of the network that is like. Um, it, it, it's hard to measure and quantify, but that is that, that is really the key thing. So if you if you can have really a, a group of people who are like you know creatively working together and they're engaged and they're really participating, that's the best you can have. Then you can solve all problems, right? Then uh, you can achieve all all, all goals. Right? That's that's true, and it has to be diverse, of course, because with this you know you you get all these different ideas how to solve the problem. Yeah, that is. That's clear. Okay, good. Thanks. So, so there is there's one final one, one final point which I wanted to discuss with you, which is uh, more specific than than the general discussion which we had so far. Also, I'm I'm looking at the clock, and Sophia has to 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 correct me, but I think we are already basically there with this first part of of our panel discussion. So, in in in, in some uh, minutes, we will open it up for questions from. Uh, from 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 the audience or from the whole group in in the session, um, uh, but before we do that, um, uh, this question about uh, involvement of you know academics and industry in 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 the network. If we if we talk about the research network, does this always mean that we we need this you know collaboration inclusion of of industry? There's certainly a trend, yeah. And uh, clearly, EPSRC is pushing for this. Also, SDFC um, that you know everything we do uh, has to have a relevance to to society. And the best way to do it is to 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 translate ideas from from academia into uh, industry and uh, into to things which which we can put on the market. Huh? So, um, is is that the, the 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 only rationale, or are there other concepts, other ideas around? So, I don't know, Matt, if you because you, you, you work exactly, I, I, I think, at this, this interface where you, you know, scoop ideas and uh, form from academia and you, 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 you help to grow them into, uh, into uh, industry, in, you know, in, industrial success, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the industrial success. I guess, the, the, ultimately, it, it's, 
Um, you know, if, if if Mark goes to goes to a meeting and comes up with a great idea, and the idea only ever remains in his head, or or, or where anybody goes to a meeting, <laughs> single Mark out. But, um, now, if 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 somebody goes to a meeting, if you have an academic network and and, and somebody goes, well, wait a minute, you know, Peter Higgs goes goes to a meeting and said, I thought of another boson. Um, then that that's not necessarily going to have any immediate return to UK PLC, but will have discovered something something amazing or the the next you know the the the, the next thing. But the point being that um, you know if if the person go, goes to the event and she puts down something on a piece of paper or something, and then that that starts off some new thought, some new process that then it, 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 it you know it, it gets out and that's an outcome from it. So the the you the industry being involved should be a way if there is some you know, if you've got something that's going to collect you know some revolutionary solar panel i'm just I'll think of an example off the top of my head so you've got something that's going to be 99 percent efficient you've discovered some new or you've got some theoretical calculation that could make a wonder material if it stays as a theoretical calculation but sooner or later someone needs to make that wonder material uh, and it's only really good if it's on all our roofs and in deserts and stuff like that. So, so somehow somebody's going to need to take that out and, and deliver that deliver that benefit. Um, so involving the people, the end well, I said the, well, in fact, yes, definitely the end users as well because we come back to the society. But but involving your your kind of supply chain into that market, and that's where industry would come in. And quantum is a really interesting example because. You know, at, at the start of this, well, quantum's the next industry. You know, it's it's the thing that, that that's coming, and one of the reasons that it gets funded, why it was funded originally, is because well, UK wants to be there. You know, it doesn't want to miss the boat if it comes round. So if we can pump prime some industry um, before this, so so I would think, you know. You know, discovery science is, is really important as well. So, if you, you know, it doesn't always have to be industry, but it probably should always have some way of taking the idea that forms from the network into its sort of conclusion and, and the benefit that your network was set up for, that it was intended to to deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 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 Mark, you 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 are involved, or you have been involved in 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 in, in the QT Hub, so. And, and they're very much about translating things from from academia into uh, into uh, products or into you know commercialization. Um, does this work? <laughs> I got an easy question as well. Didn't I? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, it it does work. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> so there are ex examples of um, say brain imaging technology being being developed hmm. and spinning out into companies and now. Um, sort of like Nottingham and, and UCL and places like that, and they're yeah. collaborating with Magnetic Shields Limited, for example, and they're, they're, so they're making new products, and that was from the Quantum Hub. So there, there are examples of where you can you can talk to people in industry, and they can say, "Oh, your idea has a problem. Actually, we don't want what you're making," and it's better to have those conversations sooner rather than later. So getting industry involved, I, I think, is kind of a shortcut in some sense. So thinking about diversity of thought, you want diversity of, of background as well. So industry hmm. have different viewpoints about what's going to be a useful product, for example, or your, whether your approach to the to the problem is the right one, or you're overthinking it, or things like that. Yeah, yeah, no, that that is that, that that's not an easy task, right? And we had a full session and a panel discussion on on exactly that how how to how to get an idea and how to define actually what it's good for yeah? um, uh, in, in, in the real world. Um, so, so, so Miriam, what, what, what is EPSRC's take on this question of how much, you know, industrial involvement has to be in, in, in a network? Is it, it mandatory or? No, definitely not. I, again, I think it, it depends. You know, if you have developed a network to, uh, you know, maybe there's kind of a new emerging topic or research area and you've just brought researchers together to, to develop it. You don't necessarily need industry input at that point. Um, it really does depend. But if you are looking to develop something, then we would expect actually for industry to be involved um, for exactly the reasons that Mark gave, that 
you need this diversity of thought, you need the potential next stage, they should be involved in these discussions as well. If there's something that you're going to look to, to, to develop and make, um, but it's definitely not mandatory at all. Um, even I think lately when people have involved industry in, in their proposals, all types of proposals, peer review actually ask questions whether it's justified or not, or do you just have Facebook as a partner because it looks good to have Facebook as a partner? Mm. Um, so it's it's not mandatory, but if you do involve industry partners, they should be there should be a justification for them to be there, and it should be obvious why their involvement is needed. Okay, thanks. So, so Sophie, do, do you want to have the last comment on this one? <laughs> wrap up no I think it's really uh interesting for me as well because my PhD now I've moved into kind of medical applications of um, physics and and kind of like Mark touched on MRI brain imaging and I suppose I, in some cases the kind of collaboration of industry can arguably convolute what your aims are because a lot of the the research that we were kind of outputting has obviously feasibility issues. And it might not necessarily be the case that um, the results and, and the methods that we're developing are applicable in the real world and, and are easily commercialized because you know, you've got so many um, other limitations on what you can actually do when you think about generating and creating a product that people actually use in, in real life. And I think there is kind of a trade-off sometimes with kind of just keeping the scientific integrity um, and kind of researching for discovery and, and openness, but then also thinking about the practicalities and um, yeah. the translation into the real world. So um, I know that for my, my particular, my research is, is quite translational, um, thinking about, you know, how things get used in the clinic and how AI um, is gonna be integrated into the real world. But, but there's definitely um, a balance there. And I think it depends on, on the research goal. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And actually, I mean, my, 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 my take on this is, is that, um, I mean, we, we have to, we are facing quite big challenges, right? I mean, we have to better get our act together and actually solve problems <laughs> which are out there. And it's, of course, nice to, to be smart and have uh, fancy ideas, but, uh, I think in the end they, they should be also useful and actually solve um, our problems or help, help to solve them. Um, okay, so uh, I, I think that was a fantastic uh, discussion. Thanks to all of you. Um, you. You may have realized that I enjoyed this massively. <laughs> so, so, so thanks a lot. Um, so, so Sophia, now, now, now I need um, your, your help with the, with the questions. I don't know how, how this works. Can you, can you let me know? Are there questions from... from uh, uh, Yes, of course. So we have a lot of questions on Slido. Um, mm. So Modasa, if it's possible for you to share your screen and share our Slido. Fantastic. Okay, so I think the, the, the questions have been voted up. So I think the first, the topmost question has has the uh, most, the highest number of votes. So if you want to start with that one, Henrik, we'll then uh, remove them as they are finished. Okay, so I, I just asked the question and whoever thinks, uh, you know, they, they want to answer or to comment on this, so, um, you know, just uh, speak in or if, if it's too many, raise your hand and then uh, I will pick one. So the first question, you, you can you can read it there. So if you're uh, there is, uh, how can diversity related data on the research network members help uh, form decisions for the network? Um, so yes, Miriam. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take diversity in kind of like the broadest sense. Um, you know, for example, if you have um, a lot of parents within your network, um, you know, and you kind of take a poll and they say, actually, we're not available after 5 p.m., then that can help planning. And it's a very simple way of looking at it, but that's yeah. an example that came to mind. It can help with planning your meetings, at a more um, accessible time and therefore make sure you have as many people engaged as possible. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what came to mind when I read that question. But I think you need to think of diversity in a broad distance, maybe beyond gender and ethnicity. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. 
Do, do, do we have other? Yes, Sophie. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, uh, with Mariam on that. I think I think essentially it's crucial. I think without diversity related data, without actually getting the stats and getting the kind of information of, of what exists in your network, then it's um, difficult to to address everything because I think you can't you can't anticipate how um, members like of a community that you're maybe not part of our feeling it's it's really difficult to do that and I think without making the effort to kind of draw in those opinions and gather the information that you need um yeah it, it's, it's really hard to, to kind of make decisions that capture um, a broad spectrum of, of needs mm -hmm. okay thanks so be before we go to Mark I just wanted to bend our our rules here a little bit so if you are if you're in this zoom session um, and if you if you have uh, a question, you can also directly ask it. It's it, it's it's uh, you know may, maybe uh, a bit fresher than re reading it from from the screen. So uh, if your name is maybe uh, James Millen and you have a question, just feel free to to speak in. Uh, so Mark, please, you you want to comment? I think, I think Matthew was first actually, so I'll let him go first. Ah, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, well, it's fine. I, I was just going to raise a plea for everybody that's that's watching this. We've just heard why it's really important. So when organizations like KTN ask you to fill in your data anon anonymously, that's why we're asking you. We're not being super nosy. We're asking you so that we can understand how to be better. So that was all I wanted to say, just a plea. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so from my point, I was, I was gonna echo a bit of, of what Sophie said about decision-making. So for example, in this, research network if you have various different career stages which I, I take to, to be diverse let's say in career stages you um, they, they could be in conflict with each other so you, I think you need to have various different points of view in, involved and to have the data about who de who decisions affect and that's that's quite in, in important to know okay yeah now James James Millen comes in with a question. <laughs> I hadn't actually uh, necessarily intended the next the next question on the slider is mine uh, actually about the okay yes yeah, so, so then read but it I, I, will ask, I will ask a different question um, which is um, where where should a network be diverse is it important for the management of a network to be diverse I just am so mindful of colleagues of mine who you know are like the rare woman in a particular community or the rare, you know, black person in a community just getting asked to do absolutely everything. And so do you think a network can still be effective if the manage if its management is not diverse as long as it takes the viewpoints of a diverse community? Oh uh, yeah, thanks James for that. that. That's a very good question. Yeah. So who wants to take it? Yeah, Miriam. Um, so in terms of the networks that will come through EPSRC, I think I mentioned it earlier that, you know, if the group themselves think that they can't reflect diversity, then they're welcome to seek um, advice outside of that, you know, to um, work with consultancies that specialise in it. Um, it's, it's an ongoing issue. If the, you know, university departments look one way, there's not so much you can do about that. Um, and again, um, you raise a really good point, James, around, you know, the, that single woman or single, single ethnic minority person being lumbered with, you know, requests to be on all these different um, boards and committees that actually doesn't help with their career, career progression, um, isn't helpful either. Um, so, yeah, if it's something that comes to EPSRC, we are happy to allocate funds for professional advice outside of like the university or that specific research group. Mm, yeah. I was, I was just going to add on to that. that I, I think all these things do take time. It's a really good question, actually, because I think about this a lot and could go back and forth sometimes. But I think I think time is is a key factor here. It's like these things require time to see change. And I think it's instant. And and I do think it's really important that kind of addressing diversity in all senses. Is tackled by all groups not just those that were affected by it so so yes absolutely um a management system which isn't necessarily diverse can 100 percent care and want to to address um 
a lack of diversity per se. But then I do think the question is always, well, why isn't there diversity? Because I mean, there's no real reason why not. Is is always the back in the thought in the back of my mind. So if I if I'm sitting on a board which doesn't seem diverse, and I care about diversity, I'm going to ask why isn't it diverse until it is diverse. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, from for, for my view, it, it's really a difficult one because, I mean, I, I, I have basically my, my world and my, my, my view on, on everything. And it, it's really difficult to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to know and to reflect and to take in, you know, different views and to, to you know, have this diversity, so to say, in, in me. Yeah? So that is difficult. So if, if I'm you know, just or, or anyone else is sitting on a board and it is just, you know, people from one group, then it, I think it's really difficult to to simply, you know, get an idea what what this diversity actually is. You know? um, so, okay, yeah, I, it's a very good question, James, yeah? and we have no good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so do do we want to move on to the, to the next question, maybe? So um then... I don't know if it's worth touching on this comment about diversity of personality since it's kind of related from Yanis. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, because I, I think it's kind of linked exactly to what you just said, actually. And it's something I find quite interesting as a researcher, especially in the academic sphere, is that you tend to get a lot of similar personalities. Um, even, with, even in a diversity in other senses, sometimes people don't think about diversity of personality, diversity of speech, mm -hmm. um, you know, location. Diversity of research topics. Research topics, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything. Um, but, but yeah, it's a really interesting point, I think, um, just kind of addressing maybe like stereotypes in, in, in research and how people should be and how they should think um, and, and kind of acknowledging that you do end up with some people who may be more quiet, more introverted, some people who are extroverted, and how do you kind of account for, for those different types of people in, in an environment where everybody should be able to, to work together toward a common goal? Can I, I've got, yeah, no, so there's a couple of different ways you can look at it, actually. So one of the ways you could look at it is when we run events, how do we cope with the people that aren't going to be shouting loudest and want to put their camera on and go, here's my question, da, 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 da. And so having the ability to put things in Slido and things in the chat. So there's things, there's ways you can sort of manage your, your network or your, or your events to, to sort of learn from that. And, and actually, we talked about, you know, how running things in online versus physical. Actually, there's things we can learn from this enforced online thing when we go into physical meetings. Does every, is everybody confident in standing up and walking over and putting their post-it on there and defending it? Or would it be good if some people can just type their thing into a mural or a slido or whatever and have it counted the same? There's another aspect of, of personalities, and it's, there's, there's category. I'm never really particularly keen on being pigeonholed in category, but there's things like Belbin and whatever that categorize different types. And if you're running a successful group of any description, whether it's a research group or a certainly in a business and particularly if you're in a small business where there's just a few of you you know why on earth would you get someone that thinks and does the same as you you know if you're the outgoing type then you should be meeting the customers if you've got someone that really good at just sort of getting down and getting the process done then you know they're, they're running your your operation so um yeah there's there's a lot of so diverse diversity of personality is something that we should we can now have the ability to do a bit more with when we're talking to big groups, but it's absolutely crucial to understand it and, and have it in, in, in groups uh, as well in, in business and academia. Mm, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, let's maybe move on simply to the next question, which is about, uh, you know, should the network last forever? That was is somehow linked to the question which we discussed already in the in the panel discussion part, which is about how do you measure, you know, the success of, of a network. So I guess you would, uh, you 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 would maybe say if it's successful, then you finish it, or maybe that even that is not correct. So what what do you think? So what what is a good time for for you know a network to to operate and to run? 
going to say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if if you if you if your my network is, uh, you know, there's not enough meta materials used in industry it could do, you know, so I might want to run a meta material. In fact, it is running a meta materials network, which is quite, but we might want to run a meta materials network for three years. Not like industry now understands meta materials. We can finish it. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm running a network, well, let's say the Institute of Physics, <laughs> this is not quite a network, but you're going, well, you know, people and stuff, Phys physics old stuff, we don't need that anymore. You know, you, it's, a, it's a bit of a daft example, but you you could imagine a network on on some sense being, you know, all the all these people are interested in this thing and will continue to be interested in this thing for the next 200 years. So um, it depends. Yeah. So I, I know of a network which is actually running for, uh, yeah, maybe 30 or 40 years, so it's called Atom Network. <laughs> so Mark, yeah, you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, I, I think the question is about whether the network can maintain itself and whether you want the network to be maintained. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, it, if it has, if it's achieved its goals and by withdrawing the network, it will, the researchers will still effectively collaborate together and it will carry on. Maybe it doesn't need funding anymore, then I think it's it's fine to, to shut it down. It's whether when you shut it down, it would then collapse and then you need another new one to start it up. So, so, but that's actually, that's a good point. So for instance, the, the Marie Curie network, I could imagine that because it is uh, about, you know, um, you know, keeping somehow a community of former Marie Curie fellowship holders together, that by definition that could run forever, right? Because there will yeah. be always, the throughput of new people, so to say. Yeah? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, any other uh, uh, comments or, or statements uh, on, on that question? If not, then the next one is, what can networks do to help early career researchers? Um, so I don't know, Miriam, if you want to uh, take that one. Um, I think there's kind of the practical side in helping maybe introducing the early career researchers to, you know, organisations such as UKRI and how they would apply for funding. But I think the other side of it is also helping ECRs to develop their own network. So, you know, meeting um, similar or related researchers that perhaps they would then, you know, pursue uh, research relationships with, professional relationships with, um, or even, you know, exposing them to more senior um, researchers that perhaps they wouldn't meet otherwise. Um, I think there's kind of those two aspects to it that I've seen um, in terms of, yeah, the effects for early career researchers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have more, more comments on it? Well, I, get, I mean, I guess I didn't know myself how to You know, you're... Well, it's kind of just just what Mariam said. Really, they're not always going to be early career researchers. They, they're going to be senior researcher professors, or they're going to be uh, in industry, or they're going to go and teach, or they're going to go and do something else. And in in all walks of life, the ability to to network, to listen to other people, to swap ideas, exchange ideas is is useful. And the more practice you can get and experience at that, at that the better. Um, so. Mm. Yeah. As, 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 as I definitely agree with everything that's been said, actually. Um, but even as a, as a practical thing as well, I think for a lot of early career researchers, um, there is kind of this lingering question of what am I going to do after this stage? So I do think networks that actively, you know, provide materials and opportunities to just discuss, discuss career options um, is always really, really important but just getting a feel for like where your research can take you and kind of what's out there and what opportunities there are. Because um, it can be quite overwhelming, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no I, 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 I agree that that's exactly the point. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, again, for, for, for myself, the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now is, is exactly because of the opportunity which, which, which have been there when, when I was at that stage. Um, and in, in a way, you can say the, the biggest problem of early career researchers is senior career researchers <laughs> because they're basically occupying the space. Uh, no, that, that's, that's not, not a, a very good comment. No. Um, okay, so um, let's, uh, let's move on uh, to the next one. That's a question 
um, about and that, that's maybe the last question, right? We are, we are almost at the end of, of our one and a half hour, so it was uh, you know very exciting and a lively discussion. Um, let's pick maybe for for the last question. Uh, there's one about social media. There's one about uh, collaboration. I don't know, Sophia, if you you have seen maybe most of the questions. Which, which one would you pick to uh, to discuss? Oh, um, I, I think they're all interesting. Um, I, th I think the international versus the, the top one, which I think has two votes rather than, than okay. the one, yeah. I would also find that very interesting. Okay, so let, let's make that our last uh, uh, question uh, for, for discussion here in this group. Um, so which is more beneficial national or international networks uh, uh, is there any difference uh, between between the two? I'm, I'm going to use Matt's line. Sorry, uh, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> I know we keep going back to it. <laughs> um, I think it really does depend on uh, the the research area, um, and I think it's it's not a very collaborative thing to say, but there's um, increasing discussions around sovereign capability and actually developing capability for the UK. Um, so potentially that has an effect as to whether you'd like to engage with international researchers or not. Um, I think the more people you engage with, the more enriched your work can be, but perhaps in certain instances, you have to be a bit more wary of whether you take something internationally or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mark? I'm going to speak up for international networks. Just <laughs> so I, think I, should. Yeah. Um, I think also you don't want to just think about your career. I mean, you want to have some fun as well. So let's, let's talk about beneficial, not just in terms of where you're going to be in 10 years, but whether you enjoy meeting new cultures and different types of people and new cuisines and stuff like that. And so there are benefits to, to being an international network, right? It's traveling the world and meeting new people, I think is a, quite a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and also, I mean, from in my view, um, you know, ac academic careers uh, are, are always, I, I think, uh, at least in, in most countries, very, very much so that you you actually do very international research. So you, you join, you know, a research group for two years in, in one country and then you move to the next one. And that's actually great. Yeah? So you, you, you learn a lot of things and you, you see a lot of diversity. And um, that's, uh, that, that's a good thing uh, about, about research. Yeah? Um, I actually also, while I was involved in this European cost network, we organize a lot of conferences at all, you know, sorts of places across Europe. Um, and there were also interesting places. Yeah? So there was uh, like a physics conference in Irice in, in Sicily, uh, which is a very famous uh, physics center. Uh, and was, what was interesting to me is was that uh, actually um, at this physics center, which was just to have, you know, meetings on theoretical physics. And, uh, you know, there, there was a procedure. It was also the place where but during the Cold War, actually, the Russians and the Americans met for the first time, uh, mediated by science. Yeah? So by scientists also, you know, politicians uh, came to talk to each other and that had a big effect on opening channels for communication. Yeah? So I think that is that also what comes with, with you know, international uh, networks and, uh, you know, maybe in times of Brexit, that is, uh, it's a very useful thing to have. Yeah? So, um, okay, good. Uh, is there anything else uh, you want to say, um, panel members? No, then uh, let me say thanks a lot. That was brilliant. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, that was uh, that was a very good discussion. Um, I'm handing over to uh, Sophia. Also, many thanks to Sophia and Mudasa and uh, Saba and Markus for organizing this and uh, getting us together. So. Uh, random applause by uh, by all of us and uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon yeah so take care thank you Hendrik thank, and you. thank you everyone for coming today I think that was an amazing session and I, I personally learned a lot and um, thank you for sharing all of your insights 
and um, um, it's it's been fantastic. Um, so just to tell everyone that this is the last event we we have for the summer. Now we, Unicorn is going to take a break, um, but we hope to welcome you in the autumn again in you know virtual format or in person meetings. Well, that'll be decided later. So thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Take thank care. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.